Dear friends, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me start by saying I hope everyone is in good health and all your loved ones are safe and well amid this particular uh, challenging uh, context. I would like to thank you all for being part of the International Peace Institute's event today. I would like to thank my colleagues, Dalia and Eliza, for their work in putting this event together. As we commemorate the international remembrance and tribute to the victims of terrorism, that was decided on the 21st of August, I would like to invite all of you to take a moment of silence, prayer or meditation to remember all those who have lost their lives, unfortunately, due to the despicable acts of terrorism. Thank you. Thank you. It's only right that we put our best efforts to preventing these atrocities from occurring again. This event focuses on youth as young people have been overlooked for too long, and you must move beyond their seat at the table as tokenism and turn it into meaningful as key agents of peace as intended by the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In 2017, IPI published an issue brief pointing to how a preventive approach to countering violent extremism that is non silent as a way to sustaining long-term peace. Today, we want to emphasize the critical role that young men and women have in these agendas. The world currently has the largest youth population ever, more than 1.8 eight billion young people that are ready to be mobilized as forces to be reckoned with. These, comp these comprise a significant proportion for our society who currently bear the brunt of discrimination, be it unemployment, inequality, injustice, etc., and who are most at risk to the lures of terrorism. As Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said in his 2016 address to the UN General Assembly, I quote, poisonous ideologies do not emerge from the thin air, unquote. It is the ongoing oppression, corruption, and injustice that have characterized these uncertain times that we have and continue to face which he correctly identifies as, I quote, the greenhouses of resentment. Of the youth demographic, UNDP has estimated 408 million to live in setting, settings affected by armed conflict or organized violence. Addressing and ultimately eliminating the push and pull factors of violent extremism, we will also be sorry, will also be a long-term challenge for multilateral, the multilateral system. Engaging youth at the heart and the helm of building communities based on shared values rooted in a culture of peace will be key to moving beyond entrenched power dynamics that reinforce their marginalization at the local, national, regional, and international levels. Moreover, ensuring that communities develop a range of mechanisms and are equipped with the tools that give individuals a sense of purpose and belonging, which will ultimately pull them away from violence and toward peace and sustainable development. One of the most effective and valuable tools in this regard is education. By providing equality education, by providing equality education, it builds learners' resilience and empowers youth to disseminate positive alternative 
and counter narrative messaging, which will enable individuals to craft the mentalities that can deflect, discredit, and dismiss ideas that promote violent extremism. The 2016 Secretary General's UN Action Plan on preventing violent extremism also included a pillar dedicated to the role of women and girls and gender equality in increasing PVE efforts as outlined in the UN Women's Youth and Gender Equality Strategy. We rightly need to aim to engender the youth movement and in youth, the movements, the women's movement, as the two groups that are the gatekeepers of peace with an estimated 600 million adolescent girls and young men. There, there has been an increasing body of research on the essential roles that women and female youth play in the CVE agenda, of which I know IPI is Women, Peace, and security WPS program is working extensively on. These are encouraging steps. To effectively mitigate the drivers of violence, violent extremism, achieve durable peace and sustainable development, we need to invest in our young men and women so they get quality education. We need to make sure that our young, young people are represented and getting a seat at the decision-making table rather than making them fight for access. Dear friends, we need to commit to working with our young partners, give them full and equal access that will equip them with, that will equip them to being the leaders of tomorrow starting today, I would say starting yesterday. In this regard, I am delighted and honored to share the floor with today, today with this amazing panel of leaders and practitioners in their respective fields. And I look forward to hearing their insights in how we can work together in making a peaceful world. Thank you so much. Let me start by uh, asking uh, Viola Christian, Program Officer of Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens to take the floor. Please, Viola. Thank you so much, Director. Um, it's such a great pleasure to be amongst you and such uh, distinguished speakers today. So thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity as the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens. I will quickly, um, if I may share my screen, that would be ideal because I do have a presentation prepared uh, for the audience. Wasn't uh, quite sure that if that would be enabled. Okay, there we go. So you should be seeing my presentation now. Great, perfect. So yeah. Um, Thank you so much again uh, on behalf of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens. Um, I'm really honored to speak to you today because uh, the topic is really of great re relevance to us and our mission and vision at our uh, organization here in Vienna. Um, let me start quickly with a quote that maybe uh, many of you know, maybe not yet, but I think it's something that we just have to um, put in our background uh, what was said by Malala uh, years ago. For me, the best way to fight against terrorism and extremism is, to, is a simple thing, educate the next generation. And that was just uh, also stressed by Director Fiji. So thank you for that. Um, However, I want to challenge this idea of education. It was mentioned quality education is of key, but what is also of key is the type of uh, education that we also give to our young generation and also to everyone, um, which is global citizenship education. We at the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens 
we really dedicate lots of our work to this concept of global citizenship education, which is also enshrined in the SDGs, in the uh, SDG 4 uh, target 7. So global citizenship education basically says that the role of education is to empower people, young people, but also everyone to become active global citizens able to contribute to building more just, peaceful and sustainable societies. So it's much more than going to school and having this exposure to the traditional curricula. It's about what we learn in school. It, it is about what we learn in non-formal education. Formal and non-formal education is key when it comes to global citizenship education. Now, we align ourselves with the understanding of uh, UNESCO when it comes to GCED, as we try to keep it sh short, um, which means that education um, should aim to equip learners of all ages with those values, knowledge, and skills that are based on and instill respect for human rights, social justice, diversity, gender equality, very important, of course, and environmental sustainability. So it has multi, multiple facets when it comes to GCED. And the idea is to empower the learners to be active and responsible global citizens. So we as GCED ambassadors, so to say, we try to give learners the competencies and opportunities to realize their rights and obligations to promote a better world and future for all. So as you can see, GCED goes way beyond the traditional sense of uh, education, but it really um, focuses on the following. On the one hand, it's about knowing. So what is it? What do we need to know to be responsible um, and active global citizens? What is the type of knowledge we need to have um, in our mind to be act, acting as global citizens. Then it's also about how do we think? What is it? What is it that is in our mind? What do we think about when we, uh, when, what are our values? What are, are our, um, yeah, shared responsibilities? So um, it's about belonging to a common humanity as well. So how do we think in that way? And then of course, it's about the behavioral the doing, what do we do? What do we need to do? What skills do we need to acquire to be able to act as global citizens? And with that toolkit of knowing, thinking and doing, GCED really has a big role in prevent, preventing violent extremism because GCED can, on the one hand, it can foster critically informed citizens um, which speaks to, of course, the sense of knowing what do we what do we know so that we can really act informatively. But it's also about uh, developing critical thinking skills and being able to uh, investigate claims, verify rumors, and question the legitimacy and appeal of extremist beliefs. So that is more about the thinking. And then further, um, we help. GCED helps learners to develop the resilience, really, I have to stress that, resilience to resist extremist narratives and acquire these socio-emotional skills that they need to really uh, engage constructively uh, in, this, in society and really taking up a role. So that really speaks to both thinking and doing, um, because these are, of course, interconnected concepts. Um, and finally, what really speaks to the doing concept, it helps young people to develop these communication and interpersonal skills that they need to dialogue, to face disagreement and learn how they can peacefully circumvent a conflict and also promote change. Just put this slide here, it, it really stresses once more what has been said, and I'm happy to share the presentation as well afterwards with the audience. 
Um, I just wanted to point out a, a few additional examples how GCED can prevent um, violent extremism. Uh, on the one hand, of course, the idea of spreading awareness of stereotypes, prejudice, and preconceptions about their impact, and also to develop a core set of values based on human rights. And the last thing that I want to uh, stress is um, also something that is maybe always left behind, developing intercultural competencies. GCD is about educating um, learners that it goes beyond what they see as their nation, their uh, region, their, their community, but going beyond that and being, being tolerant towards other uh, cultures and, and uh, backgrounds. So I, I think these key skills and these competencies are really important when it comes to preventing violent extremism. Now, where does the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizen come in? And just a quick introduction of our organization. Um, we are fortunate that we are led by two really amazing individuals, Ban Ki-moon, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, and also the former President of Austria, Heinz Fischer. We're a quasi-international organization based in Vienna, and we're, we've only been up and going since 2018, and since then have really tried to make a difference globally when it comes to global citizenship education, and also empowering women and youth um, with sustainable development goals, knowledge, 21st century skills, and also global citizen values with kind of the, of course, the, the idea to leave no one behind and this very uh, important um, need to, to um, make, it, make these ideas accessible to everyone. And in that, our work is guided by the 2030 agenda, the sustainable development goals, and also the Paris Climate Agreement. So where, does, where do we come in? What do we do? What do we do as an organization to really, um, on the one hand, uh, foster Viola. GCED? Sorry, Viola, could you please let in one of our guests, Khadija, in as you are the host? I'm the host, I'm the only host? Yes, so um, you let Khadija in and we'll uh, resume with you. She, I'm sure she would love to listen to what you're saying. There. I think now it should be done. Okay, <laughs> um, so where does the Ban Ki-moon Center come in? On the one hand, we're engaging in high level advocacy to make sure that the GCED target 4.7, SDG 4.7 is included in all curricula from primary to tertiary level. So not only do we want um, a, a limited part of, of the population to benefit from these uh, concepts, but it has to be available to everyone and from everywhere. Um, on the other hand, uh, so on Mission 4.7, we work with um, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, with UNESCO as well, uh, with um, the U University of Columbia, and different um, amazing uh, educational organizations worldwide. So that's where we really try to do this high level advocacy, ensuring that GCED is part of everyone's education. And then we also uh, work together with um, the United Nations Office on the uh, of the Secretary General's Envoy of Youth, um, how, where, with whom we published this. It's my life here, Mademoiselle. Sorry. Uh, with whom we published the We, ha we Are Here um, magazine. And this is a global policy paper um, that really works to promote the inclusion of youth in peace processes. And then finally, we work on the ground with amazing young leaders who are advocates for peace and change makers. We work with young women and youth to foster the, and foster their capacity to be global citizen leaders through SDG micro projects. SDG microprojects are small scale initiatives that work to implement and achieve one or more SDGs on the ground. So we really ask these young leaders that are fellows of ours, scholars, 
mentees as well. Uh, so we have various programs how we try to um, reach out to the young population to also guide them through the idea of implementing something for the common good for the SDGs. And the SDG micro projects are out, is our way of letting everyone know that it doesn't have to be the biggest project um, to help foster the SDGs, but it can be a small scale initiative that you can do yourself on the ground in your community. And in that we've, uh, for example, supported uh, a group of Afghan uh, women on the ground. Um, and as you know, Afghanistan is going through extremely uh, difficult uh, times right now. It's un actually unspeakable uh, times right now. And uh, our fellows are, uh, some of them are still in Kabul, some of them, are fortunate to have uh, gotten scholarships to study abroad, but it's of course some, a big concern of ours. However, I want to speak to, about their great achievements right now, which is of course, uh, for example, Sohaila, who um, implemented the Afghan Global Citizen Mentorship in Afghanistan. So she realized that there is a challenge for young Afghan youth to be in touch with international leaders. So what she did, because she had this international network, um, she put together young school girls from Afghanistan together with international women um, from, from Cambodia, from different countries, from, from Mongolia as well, and put them together and made sure that there's this intercultural exchange. I also want to just highlight uh, Barbara Nakijoba. She implemented the project in Uganda, Youth Take the Lead in Reducing Violence in Rubaga Division. So what she did is that she realized that the lack of or unemployment, poverty and in inequality um, is a huge factor when it comes to pushing um, young people into violence and, and violent extremism. And she started this initiative to provide them with uh, life skills training, and with, which focused on entrepreneurship, but also vocational training, so that they could also improve their capacity to gain a meaningful employment and start their own businesses and uh, be, you know, just make an impact that is apart from, from yeah, criminal activities that were very much predominant in Uganda. And finally, our other Afghan uh, fellow, Farida, she implemented the Talk for Peace as her SDG micro project because she founded the initiative Peace Friends. She's a civil society actor on the ground in Kabul, and she's extremely dedicated to the, the idea of including youth in the peace process. Well, yeah was very much involved in including youth in the peace process in Afghanistan. Um, and so she put together a group of volunteers who started to really dig deep uh, when it comes to how can youth be effectively included in the peace processes uh, in Afghanistan as we have seen them in the past years. So uh, her activism and their activism of all our fellows is a prime example of how everyone can, active, can be active. And that's a message that I want to give to the audience that really it doesn't have to be the main big, big project that you can do to also, um, yeah, take a role in the prevention of violent extremism. It can be something that can lie in your cap capacities and where you can make a difference. And I think that that is always something that we have to remember that it doesn't, that we can all make a difference and that we can really drive that kind of activism. And uh, that in the end, it's, it's also on us to take, on us as the young generation to take a lead and uh, in the prevention of violent extremism. And with that, I come to a close and I'm looking forward to the further talk also from my colleague speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is very impressive indeed. And uh, it's not just uh, words. And these are uh, pictures that speak louder than uh, uh, words, than speeches, than uh, 
strategies and uh, I'm impressed by the selected uh, examples or uh, tokens of success that uh, uh, the Center for Global Citizens have, uh, has achieved. Uh, impressive and uh, as I said, let's uh, get together to uh, look more into uh, common grounds. Uh, on that level, I'd like to welcome uh, my friend, uh, Madam Khadija Mala, uh, Mr. Uh, Naim Shamaila, uh, and uh, uh, sorry that you, you had to go through some uh, efforts to join us. Uh, and without delay, I'll uh, give the floor to Mr. Saji Prelis, Director of Children and Youth Programs at Search for Common Grounds. Thank you so much. And let me share my screen also. I, I hope you can see the screen that I'm sharing. I see that so nice. Go ahead. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Mr. Fiji. And it's an honor to be here. I'm really honored to be part of this important conversation. And I thank you for having me. Um, I want to share a little bit about first, where I come from with an organization called Search for Common Ground. It's an international conflict transformation, peace building organization, over 35 years young and working in over 40 countries around the world. And we work a lot with artists, with young people, media professionals, military and police groups, religious actors, government leaders, prisons and women's groups also. So in a sense, a snapshot of society in countries that are struggling to uh, transition out of conflict, so to say. And I want to spend 30 seconds talking about why young people, because of this topic being on young people itself. And Mr. Fiji, you mentioned the population demographic itself. When you look around the world, the countries in yellow and green are predominantly in the teenage years. And it's important to understand the demographic reality of this has. And these figures are from 2021. And we know one in six people between the 15 and 29 are affected by violent conflict today. What we also need to realize is that 60% of urban populations in less than 10 years, when we think about the 2030 agenda, is going to be below the age of 18. So our understanding this demographic is so fundamental if we are thinking of preventing violence, preventing exclusion, and preventing violent extremism as well. But we also are living in a reality that trust in institutions, trust in governments, trust in business, the private sector, trust in international organizations is dwindling considerably. With a minor exception, exception of Asia, across the world, the trust in institutions is going at an extremely fast pace downhill. And this is primarily because the social contract that leaders have with its people are failing. And what we are unfolding is a leadership crisis as well as a responsibility crisis as well. But where do young people fit into this violent extremism, preventing violent extremism agenda? Back in 2015, we had over 90 countries represented where young people were helping to shape the very first youth action agenda on preventing violent extremism. Back in 2015, it's the first time young people came together and defined what violent extremism means to them how they are addressing it in their communities and ways the international partners can support and amplify and partner with them to support their work itself. The picture in the bottom right-hand side is a young woman from Somalia who actually, when, when President Obama hosted the leader summit, the presidents and prime ministers from around the world, the young woman from Somalia introduced to the world this first youth action agenda itself. This is a marked pillar that helps shape what we what I'll talk to you later about called the Youth Peace and Security Agenda itself. But this was a very important milestone in that journey. But I want to focus a little bit on what programming looks like. My previous colleague talked a little bit about some great programming. I want to add to that. Before we do that, I think it's important to talk about the truth here. 
it's important to learn from even those people that we may not like. Violent groups are sometimes really effective in mobilizing you. What do they provide young people? And here are some research-based examples of what young people feel. One of them is youth feel understood. Their grievances, they have a mechanism to address those grievances. It's also that they provide young people an opportunity to feel greater than themselves. Another important characteristic as we think of how we design programs for young people. So what are the incentives that, that these groups provide that we can learn from in our approaches as civil society actors to support young people in this nexus? Here are four examples. One is focused on prevention, whether it's in Pakistan, in working with the education institutions or early warning systems in Nigeria or exchange programs online where American youth and young people in the Middle East are talking about drone attacks, talking about hijabs and what that means to people who are affected. Having this kind of conversation, going beyond the traditional education that was talked about is so critical so that young people have the prevention in their DNA growing up. Second is around disengagement. We Search for Common Ground has done programs, whether it's in Indonesia or to Morocco, in prisons, working with prison authorities, human rights actors outside the prisons, and the prisoners who are involved. And in more important to understand how to appeal to their hearts and minds through comic books, reality TV shows as well. But also a youth-led effort we've seen in Cameroon, for example, where young people who are affected by and impacted by Boko Haram are being taken away from, the, who are disengaged, are being rehabilitated so with mental health support, psychosocial support, education support, skill support to help them become active citizens in a country that they were denied as young children itself. And this is led by young people itself called Local Youth Corner Cameroon. The other is how young people are improving state responses. One of the things about state responses that we need to clearly understand is this idea of perpetrator. Often young people see state authorities as perpetrators. And at the same time, state authorities like police see young people as perpetrators. So how do we think about transforming the perpetrator mentality to a shared protector mentality? There are programs from Nepal to, the, to Morocco where we are talking about prevention approaches in the prisons itself and getting government leaders to act together with police, police on the streets. We've seen that we have done this in Lebanon also. It's important to make sure that the state responses are youth inclusive and that we transform this perpetrator mentality to share protective mentality. Other is around amplifying the new narratives. This is not about countering a narrative that is bad. This is about providing oxygen to an inclusive pluralistic narrative that all societies are, in, are part of. Uh, whether it is a young imam who is going against the grain in, and talking about issues that are in the community, or you having young people amplify new narratives in their communities itself. It's important to enable young people's voices to be heard and adults to be seeing young people as potential partners and not troublemakers. With that, I want to share with you a little bit about how this the birth of a new agenda that came about. For, for a long time, this agenda of young people was seen as troublemakers and a burden to carry. Underneath that, underpinning that was a policy panic based on stereotypes that were not well founded on evidence. What young people were did was to try to shift that narrative. The international community, based on a policy panic, were asking important questions, but not necessarily the right questions all the time. Important questions were, why are young people joining armed groups? Why are young, what are the push and pull factors towards violent extremism narratives or violent extremism groups? The important questions, but we realized that it's important if you're thinking of prevention, that we need to ask a new set of questions. And that new question starts with this question here. Why are most youth peaceful? And that question could import, it's an important question that has been neglected. So a lot of money, a lot of attention focused on a small group of people who are causing trouble 
And there are a variety of reasons why they cause trouble, but neglected the vast majority who are not causing trouble. So you ask ourselves, what message are we sending people if we are focusing on the bad people and not the good people? And this is why this important to this question is a great starting point to be considered. That led to this picture on December 9th, 2015. This is the Security Council of the United Nations taking a vote on the very first agenda on youth peace and security, first resolution 2250. It was a collective effort of over 11,000 young people from 110 countries advocating for this new concept, moving away from this binary narrative of seeing young people as troublemakers and victims to seeing young people as partners. So this resolution 2250 was adopted on December 9th. Two subsequent resolutions came to life in 2018 and 2020. What it collectively did was recognize young people as a political force for peace and gave oxygen to over five to 600 million young people who are on the front lines of preventing violence in their communities. And this is an important milestone for the agenda, moving away from this trouble binary to seeing young people as critical partners in this agenda itself. As we start to look ahead now, what's coming up in the horizon? Two things. One is about creating national commitments. In, in partnership with the government of Qatar, Finland, and Colombia, the government of Qatar, state of Qatar is hosting a heads of government conference next year in 2020, January, first quarter of 2020. There are key, two key outputs coming from this that is being developed in partnership with the African Union, European Union, and several other sub-regional bodies as well. One, how guidance for governments on how to partner with young people to develop national strategies that are inclusive of youth on preventing violence in their communities, seeing young people as partners. The second is a five-year strategic roadmap to think of peace processes to become more youth inclusive. As I speak today, our leadership crisis and our accountability crisis has come to life in Afghanistan a country with a median age of 18 and a half to 19 years of age, the median age in the country. Young people are the ones, these bad deals that are being negotiated in peace processes, the, the impact of it is falling on the hands, laps and shoulders of young people to carry and bear. That is absolutely, a, you know, when we heard about responsibility to protect, responsibility to care and act, we heard many years back, never again. And here we are now again, saying never again, but with very little oxygen in there, very little credibility, because the leadership crisis is so damaging that people have lost faith in these institutions itself. So the five-year roadmap around peace processes is focused on how to strengthen peace processes in a much more inclusive way, not just for young people, but for society writ large, where young people play a prominent role in it. But the other piece around this is shaping up is the civic stage young people occupy, physical and digital, is shrinking rapidly. The global report that was just released, called If I Disappear, that it's a state of the field on protection in young, young people's civic space, identified several key barriers to it, from sociocultural to legal to political to digital to physical. And the link is available for the download in this report. But what's important to note is when we think about violent transforming violent extremism, we need to think of addressing violence of exclusion. Violence of exclusion is enshrined in these barriers that we identify from social, cultural to physical. So if we think of preventing violent extremism, we need to really think of how to systematically, inclusively think of social, cultural barriers, political and financial and legal and digital and physical barriers that we need to address. This is, the, this is the impetus for thinking of prevention. And at the same time, we also need to be very honest about financing this youth leadership that we see. Violent groups are doing this. Civil society and governments are not doing it well enough. Here's an opportunity to think of, if you're really serious about preventing violent extremism, we need to finance youth leadership in a meaningful way without creating barriers for young people to enter it. 
young people already are doing something about this. And they've set up a global fund where young people are becoming investors in the fund, not just beneficiaries of money. As we think of the next few years, these are the key elements to keep thinking of where young people see, uh, need to be seen as partners beyond just beneficiaries alone. So, so these are key things that are shaping in the agenda in the coming years. And we welcome you to be part of co-creating it with us because we have, the, the, we have embraced a collective impact approach through the Global Coalition on Youth Peace and Security that search and the UN and youth groups are co-leading together with a lot of other partners. With that, I want to say thank you for inviting me and I'm really looking forward to being part of this important conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Saji. This is very impressive indeed. And uh, I mean, I would select one idea which is overarching the inclusive narrative towards inclusive peace processes. And I think uh, we should uh, link uh, you to our headquarters and uh, our CPO, the Center for Peace Operations, which is one of our, uh, one of the most dynamic departments in my uh, uh, headquarters. And uh, they work uh, with the Security Council, with the Secretary General of the UN, with the other uh, key, uh, stakeholders uh, around the globe. I think we will earn a lot by uh, joining hands, you uh, the search for common ground and the uh, IPI, CPU and other, of course, uh, uh, departments like uh, WPS, uh, Women in Peace and Security. So thank you very much, my friend. Uh, glad you joined us. And again, thank you for, thank you, uh, my friends. Uh, Dalia and Eliza for bringing Saji in. Now I bring my compatriot, my friend, and I stop there. Oh, sorry. Khadija, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thanks, Najib. Uh, happy to be uh, with you, despite all what <laughs> the hectic thing that happened this morning, but I am here. This is the important thing. So thanks for the invitation. I'm trying to share my screen, and hopefully I will find my PowerPoint, so voila. Okay, let me put it as in, okay, can you see my screen? You can, okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, the, um, I tried to think about essentially what role uh, would youth uh, have or should have encountering the violent extremism. I am talking much more from the perspective of the Arab state region, which is 22 Arab countries. Uh, and just I will share with you a few thoughts uh, that um, I've been thinking about how to do it and essentially how to empower and build youth resiliency to be able uh, to counter uh, violent extremism. Um, like uh, Einstein, I like very, very much to always raise the new questions and see also new possibilities and essentially maybe to see old problems from a new angle. Uh, and as Einstein said, it does require creative imagination and marks real advance in science. So the question, I'm trying to minimize this to be able to see my screen. Okay. So um, the question I'm uh, trying to raise uh, today is, Essentially, what youth are we talking about? And again, I'm talking from the perspective of uh, the region and also from the perspective of my own country, Tunisia, uh, how to reach them or to reach out to them also, uh, with which type of messages. And I try to answer those questions and other questions from the spiral dynamic framework perspective. Uh, because this model uh, with its L, uh, eight level of development that uh, relates to culture, psychological, and cognitive reality for human beings would help us essentially the uh, uh, first six level of development to reflect really what are the hindrances that we collectively have in general in facing all ism. And by ism, I'm talking about examples such as racism, sexism, casteism, classicism, violent extremism, religious fundamentalism, radicalism, all this ism. Uh, have uh, these things in common, and I will use the spiral dynamic framework to be able to answer the questions. 
Um, so uh, I, I wanted to, uh, to see, uh, are the youth at the same level? I mean, when we speak about youth, uh, there is, is there in any country a homogeneous youth or are they different? Uh, are we targeting the elite, the youth who have access to civil society organization, or are we targeting the majority of youth in any given country? And once we target them or we are able to, uh, to reach out to them, how can we unleash their emotional intelligence to support them uh, in reaching the next level of development once we see those uh, level? And essentially, how to operate a paradigm shift in our collective advocacy work in order to open a conversation about embodying the values that, rather than speaking about values. So this is the spiral dynamic that is a quite complicated type of thing. This is why I created a one that is much more uh, easy and it will help me to explain what I mean by all those developments uh, and where are the youth. Youth can be at the individual level, uh, definitely just um, youth who are uh, youth or other people here, the spiral dynamic, talk about really the development uh, of, of anybody, the psychological the development. Uh, some youth might be uh, very much at the family level, but um, uh, most we would find a majority of people of individual of our countries at the tribal level. And by tribal level, it's just the type of identity. It can be an identity related to religion, to nation, to, to anything where the person feels that he or she belongs to that entity. Uh, obviously, some of them believe in a state and all the um, constitution, the institution, anything that define a modern state. Some of them believe in humanity, meaning human rights or the international convention, all the convention on the right of the child and the, all the resolutions and everything. And of course, there is the cosmos level, with, which is much more the environment and the climate change and all of this. So once we see uh, here, um, we understand that we are speaking about a set of values, of meanings that we all learn since childhood, and they are entrenched in the very consciousness of individual, and especially the youth. It represents, in fact, the unwritten legislation. Um, we are used to talk about laws and legislation, but there is an unwritten one that rules social interaction among citizens and really form the foundation of social order, um, like a rock that gets cemented over generation because these youth, youth are not living in an uh, isolated island, they live in a society. And this society is sometimes really ruled by unwritten uh, legislation by those social interaction. And of course, it does need time sometimes to change, to evolve and eventually transform to a, a, a higher uh, stage. So this is why we need absolutely to develop the ability to see the invisible factor influencing our action and see the consequences of those actions, let it be a violence or anything else. So it is important to see it and also to recognize collectively our collective blind spots in the society and how to turn them into emergence and empowering actions. So uh, to be able, as I said, it's very, very crucial to see where are the individuals, including the youth and the communities, and to understand that we are all at different uh, level of our development. This is why it doesn't make sense to think that by doing any type of advocacy message, it will be understood in the same way of somebody who is completely within this uh, tribal stage, um, the same way that somebody who is at the human rights stage or at the humanity stage. Uh, this is why we need to adapt our advocacy speeches, tools, materials, everything according to those levels and not to, uh, according to classical grouping such as NGOs and the FBOs and the civil society and all of that or private sector or government or whatever. This is what we need because we should never underestimate the loyalty that each person, each youth has to the set of values, the youth that we are, we want them as actor or the youth uh, that are uh, victim of uh, violence. So all of this, they have this loyalty to the set of values and belief uh, they possess according to the level of development they are in. 
So I would say that, again, speaking about the region, maybe most communities are still at the tribal level, uh, essentially um, also religion, even if they don't say it, or even sometimes denomination. Uh, I was based recently in Iraq. So there you see even the denomination between Sunnah and Shia has uh, a certain importance. So again, their loyalties go to their belief, their social norms and culture. And even if their countries ratified the most, if not all, of the human rights convention and everything, it is not enough um, for them to accept even to harmonize their own national legislation according to that. And even if they do it, it's still, the, um, as I said, the ownership, the loyalty wouldn't be there. And this is why we find in many countries still, uh, I will be next month in Djibouti, still the coexistence of a legal system that is, in one hand, you have the statutory law as a, in the legal system, but you have also still the customary and the religious law, and especially when it comes to women's rights or the rights of the girl. Uh, and this is why you still can have whatever type of violence against uh, girls, such as female genital mutilation and other violence that are uh, against them. So youth, again, are loyal to their culture. Uh, and this is why we need to not assume that uh, necessarily they would believe right away on whatever human rights principle or gender principle. And really the question is how to reach out to them with the right messages without having them feeling and interpreting it, it as an attack on their culture. Uh, and um, uh, here I will, uh, I will not move. This is, you know, the, um, OK, I will not speak about this point because I will need a lot of time to explain it. So this is why I believe uh, definitely that uh, it is time now to think differently, to design differently, to dream, to write, to speak differently. And just the, the presentation before mine started explaining how to do things differently in other uh, part of the world. Uh, maybe it is time also for us uh, to think about it. And for me and the experience I have in uh, all the Arab countries for quite some time is definitely to design a different resiliency curriculum program. It consists of 120 hours that would really support the youth to be able to become uh, the actor we want them to become. There is something extremely powerful that we did use uh, for the last at least uh, 15 years now in the region, uh, which is uh, the conscious full spectrum response model based on the work of Dr. Monica Sharma with her uh, book, Radical Transformation Leadership. And having um, used this essentially with lead, uh, religious leaders, because religious leaders, you have all the type of religious leaders, the, uh, the conservative, the extremists, the other ones. It's, it's a huge thing, and it is uh, very much linked. Because as I said, the problem with the ism is that the issue is not religion. It is how certain people interpret religion to justify uh, terrorism or extremism or fundamentalism or whatever things to send youth even kill in other countries in the name of religion. I mean, all this, it's so complicated, so complex that we cannot uh, respond to it in an easy way. And definitely the conscious full spectrum response model is really something that is very, very powerful. There is also, we need to set up a youth taker protection program. I, I just heard about uh, Afghanistan. The examples, I mean, all of those uh, youth risk, uh, risk takers that are then uh, should not be left uh, like this. And even if we don't go to the extreme case like Afghanistan, even in most countries, we have to have the first picture I saw on my, uh, uh, on my PowerPoint is a young uh, um, uh, blogger, uh, Lina Benemhenni, uh, uh, the late Lina Benemhenni, who, who was also a very uh, youth uh, risk taker. But we know that when she has been harassed and uh, violated by the police. Uh, very few people stood by her until now. Uh, her parents are still uh, continuing um, the fight. So it's not that easy. And uh, of course, we have always to keep in mind the guaranteeing the doing no harm principle, because sometimes we think we are doing the right thing, but we might harm people, even the people we are here to empower or to help or whatever. So finally, I will conclude by saying that transforming youth from victim of violent extremists to actor working synergistically with all stakeholders. And here also, it's very important. There is nothing as just uh, youth working alone. It wouldn't make sense if you want to have the best impact 
by doing synergistically, meaning one plus one equal 100, we know we need to join our forces uh, for uh, hopefully a world free from all sorts of violence and in total solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Khadija. That's an awesome presentation that's to the point and uh, what uh, an ambitious and uh, of course doable program with women like you. Uh, I mean, I will uh, certainly uh, share with you that very, very uh, important conclusion uh, where you uh, said uh, the aim is transforming youth from victim of violent extremism to actors working synergically with all stakeholders for a world free from all sorts of violence and uh, in total solidarity. I wish you all the best and please rest assured that we would be very, very happy to join you in uh, the next steps of your very uh, ambitious and uh, promising and encouraging uh, itinerary. Now, I'll uh, go to uh, my friend Maine Shamaira, is the co-founder of the MENA Coalition for Youth, Peace and Security. Maeen, nice meeting you, my friend. And the floor is Thank yours. You. Thank you so much. Um, uh, can you hear me well? Can you hear me, please? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry for uh, getting late uh, due to the internet connection. So thank you for inviting uh, me, uh, and uh, thank you for all uh, the speakers. Uh, first of all, I would like, um, in behalf of my colleagues, I would like to thank you, and I would like to just to give a brief about the MENA coalition. Uh, this co uh, coalition uh, uh, was established in the 2020 in the occasion of the uh, International Day of Peace and on the fifth anniversary of adopting uh, the Security Council Resolution 2250. Uh, so, um, uh, just I, I will uh, start from uh, where Saji uh, end. So uh, after 2015, uh, uh, there was uh, a new uh, uh, focus on, on the uh, security uh, and uh, peace uh, issue. So uh, while this is running on in, in, in the world, uh, we felt uh, that uh, there is a gap in the MENA, uh, MENA region uh, uh, on the role or focusing on the role of youth in peace and security. So uh, we start thinking in 2018 uh, uh, to, to, to uh, unify the efforts uh, came by the young people in the, in the, uh, in the region. So uh, in, uh, in the last year, we, uh, uh, after um, a lot of discussions and meetings, we decided to launch this coalition to unify the efforts of the young people in the in the uh, MENA. And our role, uh, uh, we are focusing on, on uh, our, our role uh, is to advance the YPS agenda in the uh, MENA region and to shed light more uh, on this uh, agenda. Also to facilitate and coordinate the leader, youth leadership in YPS agenda. Also to building a bridge of cooperation and partnership between between the international and regional uh, networks and uh, uh, other stakeholders. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, our uh, coalition, and we are uh, uh, also have the, the, the vision to keep working on this agenda and to help the international community uh, to, uh, to, to bridge the gap between the uh, local uh, uh, communities and uh, the international and to to bring uh, um, the uh, the people for more uh, discussion and how to cooperate and how to uh, uh, participate or contribute in in the world stability. Uh, as all we know that uh, the MENA region uh, uh, in the MENA in the MENA uh, region conflict and hostilities combined with the economic downturn and government challenges and continue. Uh, uh, the uh, devastated uh, and society, uh, societies and contribute uh, uh, to increase the humanitarian and uh, protection needs. Uh, so um, uh, with this um, uh, 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 conflicts and uh, this um, uh, harm for the young people, uh, um, uh, still the MENA countries 
continue to suffer uh, from the systemic violence, such as injustice, corruption, and failure of governments. And in the same time, uh, youth and youth organization continue to fight uh, for peaceful change that achieve inclusive uh, and justice and democratic societies uh, in spite of, the, uh, of all these challenges. Uh, and they were able to show their resilience uh, in their communities. So, um, in spite of the various international initiatives, and as such, they mentions and give more details about the 20 to 50, uh, uh, the young people uh, uh, or the young men and women, they, uh, they were very active and driving positive change in their uh, communities. And uh, uh, the, the, still, the MENA region uh, remain a difficult place for uh, them to engage uh, uh, for any change or lettering the conditions they are affected by. So uh, I don't want to more, more focus more details on the uh, uh, Security Council resolutions and the YBS agenda because uh, Saji, he had uh, in, uh, uh, make uh, or he had introduced it already. But uh, the, the, the idea of uh, our role in the MENA coalition uh, uh, um, uh, as uh, these security uh, council resolutions are important uh, for uh, supporting the young people uh, in shaping and achieving stability, the challenge of these uh, uh, resolutions is, is the absence of implementation mechanism uh, and the tools uh, on how to move uh, uh, or to implement the, this agenda uh, and to move from the uh, theoretical, uh, uh, theoretical uh, uh, issue to, to the practical one. So uh, uh, actually, uh, we are trying uh, in the MENA coalition to uh, uh, find solution and to help the young people uh, uh, to be familiar with this agenda and to play a role. One of the uh, recommendations all, 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 all the time we are focusing on how to uh, invest in, in, in collaboration and partnership with different stakeholders, but we need to, to focus more on the uh, uh, digital uh, 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 platforms to, uh, uh, to to help the young people uh, to uh, uh, to use these uh, uh, platforms uh, in peaceful way. So, uh, and I think this question also came from from Saji. Why, uh, if we are asking the question, why the young people? They're drawn to, to, to violence, but we have to, uh, to raise the, the question why the young people are uh, uh, drawn to, the, uh, to, to peace. So this is how the, the young people, they are playing a role. Uh, just I want to, uh, to, to conclude uh, uh, that there is uh, an urgent need to, uh, uh, to involve youth in BV efforts, uh, and we are not uh, uh, um, uh, looking or, or we don't need to, to consider uh, uh, that uh, uh, consider them as a beneficiaries but uh, in, in the uh, BV strategies but as usually uh, uh, or as usual, uh, but uh, young people are rather than strategic partners for the success of BBE uh, strategies as they better understand their peers' grievance as a credible voices or as a role model uh, or as a local leader. So uh, youth can contribute to making uh, uh, BBE legitimate and effective in some communities for, the, uh, for the, this change to happen. Uh, uh, youth must be part of all stages of such uh, strategies uh, from their design to their implementation and their evaluation. And uh, this is, uh, we think this is the only way they can participate uh, uh, and uh, can play a role in, 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 in this issue. So I will stop here. If you, uh, you have any question from uh, you or other colleagues, uh, I'm ready, um, uh, I'm happy to answer all these questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jermaine. And in fact, uh, you Depend the uh, lack of, of the absence of implementation of UN Security Council resolutions to a conflict that has uh, lasted more than uh, ever. And uh, uh, hopefully, with the coalitions like yours, we uh, can uh, you can contribute to uh, pushing towards uh, our uh, old and uh, forever dream durable, comprehensive, and just peace in uh, the Middle East and uh, uh, beyond. Thank you again for the uh, focus uh, on the for uh, peaceful ways 
and uh, means to uh, uh, approach uh, divides, conflicts, and uh, others. Thank you, Maïn, Let, uh, let's uh, stick together, please. Uh, we are behind you and count us uh, as members of your uh, coalition. Last but not least, and the last word would go to my sister from Africa, Christine Odea. Christine is the global coordinator of Commonwealth Youth Peace and Ambassadors Network. This, you have the last word, and uh, that's what we will keep with respect to the uh, other speakers. Thank you so much, Mr. Najib. Um, do I have the sharing rights? Can the host please help me share my screen? Okay. Uh, please, may I share my screen? It still says that it's disabled. It should be enabled already. Okay, yes. I hope you all can see my screen now. Um, all protocols observed. I really feel honored to be joining the incredible speakers today and really want to thank the organizers of this very timely yet um, impactful conversation and standing in solidarity with everything that's happening around the world and specifically the youth in Afghanistan and uh, what is happening in um, Afghanistan. We stand in solidarity, we are watching and we won't remain silent. The Commonwealth Youth Peace Ambassadors Network is a network of young people who cut across arts, entrepreneurship, and everything that Saji was pretty much trying to talk about. When the UN resolution was formed in 2015, we realized that a lot of young people were developing themselves or forming organizations or going against the conventional ways of organization to make sure that they are able to express and implement some of these resolutions at their local level. However, since it's still a new idea, we didn't have structures in place, we didn't have frameworks in place to make sure that this happens. And that is how Saipan was formed. Saipan, um, together with other young peace builders come together and decided to form the Commonwealth Youth Peace Ambassadors Network, supported by the Commonwealth to make sure that young people are part and parcel of the decision makers young people are taken as key stakeholders and key part partners when it comes to speaking on issues, um, peace and security, and making sure that we leave no one behind. So Saipan as an organization is um, structured in a manner that we optimize grassroots, national, regional, and commonwealth, and global issues that speak on to peace and security agenda you will realize that ideologies do not have borders. Radicalization do not have borders. It cuts across. So much as we are supported by the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth member states are 54, we still engage with other uh, young people from across the world to make sure that peace agenda is all our agenda. And so we connect with every young person we don't segregate, you don't have to be in a civil society, you can be an entrepreneur, you can be um, an artist, you can be a filmmaker. And this is to really bring a holistic approach when it comes to addressing peace and security issues. A lot of countering violent extremism um, strategies are embedded on understanding what is really crucial for young people. And in addressing the push and pull factors, we also need to make sure that all these other uh, ideas and, and the passions that young people have are addressed at the root causes. And so that is basically what the Commonwealth Youth Peace Ambassadors creates, a platform where these young people can meet and interact and share ideas and make sure that we also have 
a supporting system where we're not just talking to ourselves as young people, there's that intergenerational and multi-stakeholders approach in making sure that much as these are the things we're experiencing in the grassroots in our communities, it is also amplified in a manner and structure that uh, put, uh, politicians, governments, uh, decision makers are able to comprehend and listen to us holistically. So looking at the structure, now that we are a global network of organizations, we have, again, like I said, we are supported by the Commonwealth Secretariat. And so through the Commonwealth Youth Programs, that is sort of where we start. However, as you can see from the diagram, it goes down up to the national and, and the grassroots level. So it's bringing the global to the grassroots, but in a way that young people are able to, again, explain their issues in a way that addresses their core issues in the community. One issue that we have been experiencing is a lot of young people saying policies are too elitists. And so most of them are not able to comprehend and interpret some of these policies, but when they are synthesized in a manner that speaks closer to what is happening in their specific communities, in their specific countries, then it makes more sense. And we're seeing a lot of young people, again, coming out strongly to make sure that all these spaces are safeguarded and the communication and no one is really left behind in the youth peace and security and women agenda. So when looking at the role of young people in partnerships in policy formulation and advocacy, communicating the findings that they're experiencing on the ground, because these are the people who interact with their communities on a day-to-day -day level, and also creating a broader membership where we can share best practices and make sure that we are not working in silos, but we have people to support us. We also have the international level, um, having organizations like Search for Common Ground, reaching out to young people and sharing experiences across the board. Our agenda is to basically create a community of peace builders, because again, we do not want to work in silos because peace agenda is all our agenda, right? And we cannot afford to work in silos. So coming together and making sure that um, the policy paper that um, uh, was shared before the We Are Here policy paper, inside the room, outside the room, and around the room, all these rooms are intertwined so that we are also able to speak across the board amongst and to each other in, in, in looking at a holistic approach to addressing peace building. Looking at the protection and safeguarding protocol, that has been very important because largely we're seeing a lot of young people participating in their day-to-day -day civic spaces, but we are also not seeing them being protected from the atrocities that are happening um, while they try to participate. So as the Commonwealth Youth Peace Ambassadors Network, we also try to create frameworks where we can have the different countries and the different uh, ways that young people uh, would like to participate, also protected and safeguarded in um, the peace building agenda. And honestly, also asking for resources. We know again, that has been one of the major critics that youth organizations face. A lot of youth organizations run on voluntary base. And so this has been amongst one of the hardest not to cracks when it comes to um, developing a lot of these community-led solutions. And we've been um, privileged enough to have launched the Youth Peace Fund, but then we need more support when it comes to addressing these issues. There's nothing for us without us. So again, resources are very important when it comes to addressing um, how the network runs and how the network, uh, the, the, the organizations within the network are also able to uh, fully uh, get a grasp of what it is that they're doing and also just tapping into the global um, agenda and, and, and um, implementing some of these policies that we keep talking about. So when it comes to the recruiting of members, we not only just want to have a database of young people who are doing a lot of good work in their communities, we are also uh, training them on different um, skills, uh, we just, just yesterday, we finished a training on social media advocacy. 
And among the many questions that young people had were, we are so fixated on the online space and we're forgetting the offline space. So how do we make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind even as we um, interact with these new technologies that are coming out? We also motivate other members who might seem to be really coerced with what is happening in their, in their countries and in their conflict situation where they are. But we also make sure that these are people who are not left behind and they're also part of the bigger picture. Uh, we also offer advice, support, and really coach them to make sure that they understand um, the protocols, they understand how to really package yourself when you want to push an agenda nationally, regionally, and uh, globally. Um, when it comes to communication, uh, most of you might realize that the Commonwealth launched the Youth Development Index just the other day in um, August. And so when it comes to the communication strategy, we have the communications, now that we are supported by the Commonwealth, internally amongst the Commonwealth, but we make sure that this information is shared across the board. We don't discriminate uh, because we are young people, much as we are supported by the Commonwealth again, we are open and we welcome all youth opportunities um, to inform impact and, and, and uh, build peace globally. Our advocacy strategy has also been pegged on policy and the creation of, uh, of position paper as young people and as people who are really affected directly by um, some of these atrocities that we experience. And also just changing the status quo of seeing young people as perpetrators, but mostly amplifying the voice that young people are the majority and are agents of peace. Uh, we do this also through a lot of projects. We have projects cutting across um, the Commonwealth regions and um, also reaching out to um, outside the Commonwealth regions. Just recently, we had a discussion about the effects of, of uh, the Afghan refugees to some of the Asian countries and also across, because again, we've seen a lot of some of the refugees coming from Afghanistan being hosted in African countries. What does that mean for young people who are going to be interacting with these people and how best can we make sure that we also create a platform where we're able to learn from each other and humanically help each other um, face all these hard um, times. So when it comes to the functioning of the, of, the, of the network, we have meetings of the networks. We can do that sometimes regionally and sometimes across the region. So we're also able to see how best to complement the efforts of another region. Um, meetings with, with um, our stakeholders, engaging partners across, and um, engaging partners externally from the Commonwealth, and also just making sure that all these things are reported so that we do not leave out any critical information that might help in the peace and security agenda and also identifying the key trends that are happening within uh, the spectrum and looking at passing forth and, and, um, and uh, pulling the younger people who are coming behind us and leaving a platform where they can also feel like they belong they can share in a community of other peace builders and making sure that we hold their hand and make sure that um, it's a continuous process. The conveyor belt is still moving. And looking at all that that I've said, we want to form a vibrant, structured and diverse network of members across many organizations. And like I said, we don't discriminate you don't have to necessarily be a community-led organization or an NGO. You can be an entrepreneur, an artist, a filmmaker. We want to have all these people in one room so that we are able to share and, and speak to how these issues affect us across the board. Looking at policies and position papers, again, we can, um, the, to get a legal mandate, it has to come in form of a policy. And now because that's the best way to structure ourselves and look for ways to implement some of these policies, we cannot, you know, ever overemphasize on um, policies and some of this position paper. And again, just looking at how to resource, how to implement some of these uh, policies that we, we keep talking about. And um, finally, again, just going back to the conveyor belt, every year 
we make sure that we have rotational ideas and, 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 and uh, reaching out to the global conversation around UPS and um, trying to also manage and, and, and uh, the knowledge that is coming from our grassroots organization, young organizations of, of uh, these builders. And with that, I really thank you for this time. And um, I hope we continue to build a peaceful world. I thank you. Amen. Thank you, Christine. And uh, uh, we uh, cannot say more than all uh, our support, our encouragement to uh, what you are uh, engaging, uh, what you are doing to engage uh, youth and grassroots uh, in this huge gathering that goes uh, around the globe, the Commonwealth, through training, uh, policy advocacy, etc., and uh, to create a community of peace builder uh, resourcing uh, youth leadership is really what comes to uh, the mind of uh, every uh, person who is attached to uh, streamlining peace in the minds of everybody. So, as I told my previous uh, speakers, uh, count us with you and uh, um, uh, I would ask all of you now to see with uh, Dalia and uh, uh, Eliza and myself where we could follow up. I don't want, and we don't want that this uh, sort of activity uh, is uh, linked to uh, an event, a remembrance or uh, whatever. I think uh, we don't have to uh, stay. Um, you're not, I'm not saying you are staying uh, uh, yeah, either, but uh, uh, we have to mobilize the maximum uh, people around us. Think tanking is good, but we are uh, do tanking as well. Uh, and we try to work with our partners, be that the uh, Secretary General, the uh, Security Council, the uh, different uh, uh, multilateral uh, system uh, bodies, as we are strong believers that the world is better with a healthy, sound, and effective uh, multilateral system. Uh, I don't want to conclude before asking uh, if anybody has a question, uh, please, or a remark or something to add, you're most welcome. Uh, I don't know if you uh, see or hear or any hands raised. If I don't see uh, any, I would like to thank Viola, Saji, Khadija, Naeem, Christine, uh, Eliza, and Dalia uh, for uh, joining us. And I will uh, uh, take it as a commitment to meet you soon uh, online or physically and we uh, should work together to continue this on this very uh, encouraging uh, initiative may peace be on you and uh, you are partners in peace and please do not hesitate to get back to us and we'll be more than glad thank you uh, Sergi. Uh, to uh, think together uh, towards the uh, coming steps. And uh, I think we have a very, very long itinerary, it's more than 1,000 mile journey, and uh, our steps count in the, uh, among uh, all other uh, deployed different, different parts of the world to make the UN agenda come true. And uh, on that line, we the peoples, we have committed to work on peace. And here we are, the representatives of the different parts of the world uh, working together. Uh, I cannot uh, thank you uh, enough. And I'm really encouraged by your uh, participation. And uh, I hope we'll meet uh, soon again. And this will be left to all of you, and especially to Eliza and Dalia, to reconnect and think of what comes next 
uh, to uh, follow up on this fantastic journey uh, towards peace, security, and sustainable development. May peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum and see you soon.